He studied his undergraduate degree at Lanchester University, followed by a master's at the University of Durham in the UK. He is currently doing a PhD at uh, Queen Mary University of London under the supervision of uh, Dr. Rodolfo Russo. His current research interests are based on trying to understand microstates of supersymmetric black holes beyond the counting problem, particularly using holographically dual CFD techniques. And he will be talking on insights into black hole microstates from ads 3 holography. Uh, thank you again. Thank you for being here. The screen is yours. You can start. Okay, great. Thanks very much for uh, inviting me. Um, I'm so sorry. Uh, let me uh, uh, fix something. Uh, it's not three o'clock afternoon, but four o'clock afternoon in Turkey time for Jada's talk. Okay. I'm sorry. You can go on. No problem. Okay, great. Uh, right. Yes, I'm going to talk on 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 some insights from fastball proposal. Uh, specifically using tools of holography and uh, hopefully a nice general uh, overview of the, the field because um, most people I find are not, not at all familiar with it. So, so here is my outline. Um, the majority, the first two sections are two sides of the coin of the background of the general setup. Uh, section three is a first example of something we can do with our newfound knowledge, and section four is uh, maybe some hints of what we what we can do, and then I'll summarize what's been done and what 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 hasn't been done. Okay, so let me just start uh, initially just from string theoretic setup. The this whole setup derives from string theory, but uh, string theory will not be used explicitly in, in this talk. Um, so we start from type 2B string theory, and we have it on, on backgrounds of R1, 4 cross S1, Y cross T4. The T4 we take to be string scale, and so small, and uh, the S1, Y we have macroscopic. So here we then uh, have a stack of D5 brains and a stack of D1 brains, and they both wrap the common macroscopic S1, Y. And the D5 brains also wrap the, the microscopic T4. And then we have some perpendicular uh, spatial form manifold, which for this talk will always be um, R4, although theoretically um, within certain constraints, it, it, you can choose the space manifold, but this, this choice will have specific nice uh, qualities for what we consider. So we're now going to consider the supergravity limit, hence no more string theory. Um, so we're going to reduce to just the massive spectrum. And this system is one quarter BPS. Uh, and this is with respect to um, the, the 32 supersymmetries of type 2B um, supergravity. And this is called D1. This here is called the D1D5 system. And here, this is called the D1D5 P system. It's just a bit of nomenclature. Um, we can also choose to add left or, or right moving uh, momentum waves along the S1. And this can have nice consequences, as we'll see. And um, just to note, this is now 1.8 BPS. OK. So what happens to the supergravity theories? Well, we are going to simplify and consider um, configurations that are invariant um, under the coordinates of the T4. And so we can reduce our problem to, to 60, and everything now will be in, in 60. But these states you can always, these configurations you can always uplift to 10B if, if you want to. So this is the general um, chain of, of ideas. And this chain is not, not strictly important for this talk, but I just want to point out what theory we are actually working in in 60. Uh, the general theory that we'll be working with is in this 60, uh, 2, comma 0. Um, I just will point out that I could equally consider a, a K3 surface instead of T4, in which case not that much changes in, in the final conclusions, especially as we're considering the large end limit. Although I should note here, you'll get 21 tensor multiplets uh, as the matter instead of five. Um, okay, yeah, that's just for a note. 
Okay, so if I consider this, this setup, then I can very easily um, uh, I can look for the solutions with two or three charges, depending on whether I'm in the D1D5 or in the D1D5P system. And these are the uh, contest charges of, of, on, the, on the brains. And I, I can, I mean, the, the first thing you, you can write down is the, the background uh, um, of, these, of these brains. I can find this in any, any textbook I like. Um, and the thing to note, there's a couple of things to note. Um, in these coordinates, the horizon is at row equals zero, but I can always just shift that. Um, this is all also independent of the S1, Y coordinates. And if I choose to compact, if I choose to reduce this metric on the, on the S1, I get the uh, stromager vapor black hole of this reference, which is uh, a very famous uh, 5D black hole black hole solution. This is called the three charge solution because it contains Q1, Q5, and QP charges. But we can do things differently. And this is a very long short, a very long story, uh, very, very short. But if you do it smartly, then you get what are called superstructure solutions. And uh, yeah, if you're interested, I recommend looking at reviews because there's no way I can <laughs> summarize the whole um, program in, uh, in one talk. But let me give uh, a general definition. When I talk about superstrata, I'm talking about smooth horizonless solutions. These are the uh, very key words here to bosonic sector of supergravity with the same asymptotic structure as a given black hole. So the idea here is that we, we pick our favorite black hole, for instance, the Stromer-Javatha black hole, and we look at these classes of supergravity solutions that can act as microstates for our black hole. We're really considering the black hole as some um, classical ensemble of, uh, of microscopic um, states, but I'll come back to that. So how do we get these superstructure solutions? Well, we have to solve uh, a very complicated uh, set of layered BPS equations uh, of the supergravity theory, the 60 supergravity theory, and impose um, some conditions on the solutions. We impose smoothness because well, that's in our definition after all, and no time like uh, closed time like curves. And it turns out that this is this is made possible for the choice of base manifold of R4 um, because the equations, if you try hard enough, exhibit linearity and allow. Um, solutions be found, although um, this is not an easy process. I, I'm making it sound a bit trivial, but um, this is a large program of body of work that's, that's gone into this, not me personally over the years. Um, and one th key thing for this talk is that um, the system and these solutions will have an asymptotically ADS3 cross S3. And OK, the T4 comes along for the ride if you want to consider the 10, 10D solution. Um, and in the decoupling limit. So this is key because we want to use holography here. And so this ADS3, asymptotic ADS3, is, is behavior is, is important. So let me give a few fairly trivial examples that were understood a long time ago, 20 years ago now. And uh, well, OK, firstly, global ADS3 cross S3 is, is, a, is a solution. I mean, not very exciting one, but empty ADS3 is a solution. And also uh, supersymmetric conical defects. Um, for instance, I can write down a, a, a metric like this. I should note that in this talk, uh, when I talk about the supergravity solutions, I'll always give the metric part of the solution. And, but you should keep in mind that the other fields uh, also have solutions. Right? Um, so here, this is just yeah, um, integer k. This describes the deficit angle, angle in ADS3 and then crossing an S3. OK, some simple examples. So let me give the, uh, before I move on to more complicated and more interesting examples, here is the general kind of um, dogma that we have in mind in the fuzzball program. And the idea is that uh, when we take, think about black holes, we, we are, we are on, from a string theoretic point of view, the, the finite size of the underlying bound state, which describes the black hole, radically changes uh, through quantum effects, 
the uh, the structure of the, the geometry and uh, specifically where the horizon would be. And the, the idea is that we won't have uh, a horizon and we also won't have a singularity at the center. And, and this has the uh, dream effect of, of getting unitary uh, Hawking radiation and essentially resolving the information loss paradox. But OK, this is all getting a bit wishy-washy and it's not my territory, no place to say. But uh, this was initiated by Samir Matur. And uh, here is, for instance, a, a review, a pedagogical review of that. So this is just to give some general context to the fr framework that I'm, I, the sort of conceptual framework I'm working. OK, here is a more complicated and more interesting solution. So it, this notation will become clearer when I study the CFT, but this, this uh, family of solutions I'm going to call the 10n family. It's a one parameter family. And um, well, OK, maybe, okay, maybe not one parameter, maybe two parameters. But um, in the decoupling limit, what we have is an asymptotic ADS3 cross S3 region. And this, along with the, uh, an ADS2 cross S1 throat, this looks essentially like extreme or BTZ, uh, which is uh, the black hole solution when reduced to, to 3D. And this, um, this uh, length of the throat is controlled by, by parameters in the solution. The longer the throat, the more it uh, resembles BTZ. But the idea is when you have an ensemble description of a black hole, all of these uh, configurations are valid microstates, just some are more likely or, or typical than others. But the idea is then instead of going infinitely deep in the throat, which would be with the horizon of BTZ being somewhere here, um, here we have a smooth cap off. And okay, it doesn't have to be this particular um, geometry that I've shown, but there can be wiggles or whatever here, you have degrees of freedom. But this is the general idea. So there is no singularity, and this caps off just before what would be horizon scales. Okay, I'm going to study this particular um, class. This is a special class. It's kind of the bumpy spherical cow uh, type solutions. But uh, this they have nice properties like separable wave equations and integral with geodesics. Um, these are found um, in these kind of series of references here. So it's fairly recent, still fairly recent work. Okay. Um, for simplicity and ease of fitting onto, um, onto a, a single slide, since these uh, geometries are quite complicated, I'm going to take the n to zero of the previous uh, idea. It's a bit special, but here we go. This is actually a two charge uh, example, which means that there are no, we're in the D1D5 system, not the D1D5P system. It's a little bit different, but it's easier for me to describe. So here we have two. Um, parameters that we can vary that, that, that describe our family. And for this particular class, we can actually uh, write in some reduced form on an S1, uh, sorry, an S3, sort of KK ansatz type form. And here the uh, X alphas are coordinates on the S3 and the X mu are coordinates on the ADS3 part. Now, it turns out for this example that if you do this, it's not generically obviously not true, but in this example, then this metric here is independent of the S3 coordinates, which is key to have a valid reduction of the problem to, to three dimensions. So basically, we can ask questions about these, these microstates uh, in, in 3D rather than 6D. Uh, and this is, well, depending on who you ask, this is, this is um, indicative of nice consistent truncations of the supergravity theory. OK, so uh, this particular metric I can write down to 3D1. And uh, it depends on these two parameters, A and B. And imposing smoothness gives you this algebraic relation between the two. Now, we fix, for a given solution, we fix A0 because it, it's, uh, it's in terms of the charges and the S1 radius. So we, we fix those as our system. And then this gives us a, the smoothness gives us a relation between the two parameters. And if you study, if you look at this, mm, close enough, you, you can kind of see that if you take B to zero, then you reduce to global ADS. And if you take uh, A to zero, uh, which is the same as, yeah, well, from this relation, you can get the limit on B. 
then uh, if you take the hard limit, strictly speaking, it's it's extreme extreme or BTZ. Although it's that the exact a equals zero is a bit special, and requires an extra talk. Um, okay, so now let's use let's sort of dive into holography and the use of holography in these systems. And uh, we want to identify the CFT states in the dual CFT that these superstrata solutions refer to or, or, or are dual to. And uh, we have in, in, in mind that heavy pure CFT states will, in some conceptual way and more explicit way later, um, be dual to these uh, superstrata solutions. Pure being uh, a pretty key, key word because um, the idea is that the sort of typical classical black hole solutions are, are dual to like thermal ensembles of, of pure states. And I'll define heavy in a minute. Um, so the dual CFT, well, the, um, if you look at the world volume theory in, of, the, of the brains, then the, you can flow in the IR to a, a fixed point and then this theory has a special point in the moduli space and that's kind of the easiest place or the, the best handle we have on it because it's a free theory and it's symmetric product orbifold uh, super conformal theory in two dimensions and uh, the target space is, is this um, uh, orbifold of, of t4 and uh, the spectrum of the of the theory um, uh, can be can be you know, categorized in in terms of the conjugacy, conjugacy classes of the symmetric group Sn. Uh, so the symmetries of this theory, well, it's a it's a CFT two D CFT. So we have Virasoro left and right. We have n equal four comma four supersymmetry. We have uh, R symmetry, which is SU2 left or SU2 right. And this comes from the, the um, normal R4 that's to the brain setup. And then we have some global SU2s from the originate from the T4. Okay, not, not too important, but we will actually use some of these generators to, uh, to make the states that we want. And the central charge of this theory uh, is 6N1, N5, or we're going to group these together and call this capital N. Slightly different from n equal four super Mills type notation, which is would be N squared uh, for the central charge. Details again, not too important for this talk, but interesting nonetheless. Okay, so let's look at part of the spec spectrum. I can start in the NS sector of the theory and let me look at, um, well, chiral primaries or, or anti-chiral primaries in this case. And they are labeled by um, their eigenvalue under the Virasoro L0 um, operator and also the third component of uh, the, the left sector of the R symmetry. And uh, for anti chiral primaries, we, we get this relation. Uh, if you impose that these states are annihilated by certain supersymmetry densities. Now I'm going to consider two particular examples. The first one is this zero zero state, which is just the unique NS and S vacuum. And this, well, this is just dual to the empty ADS3 or cross S3 uh, in the bulk. And also this uh, example of an anti chiral primary and uh, where K is some integer um, from one to N, capital N. Uh, and these are examples of light states. When I say light in this talk, I'm going to mean order one uh, conformal dimensions when I take a large central charge or a large capital N. Now, okay, the question is where are the black holes? You know, how, how do I create a state that's going to back, that's going to have some back reaction in the bulk and create its own, its own geometry? Well, if I take a spectral flow of these, of these states, then I access the RR sector. And the RR sector starts at heavy states. It starts at states that go like C over 24. And these are what I call heavy, which means that they scale with the central charge in the large central charge limit. And, uh, and these, these two uh, NS uh, light 
states that I have here will flow to RR ground states. And these RR ground states we will use to construct the, the dual states of our, of our superstrata. So a nice review uh, here, but more explicit because there are many more RR ground states. There are, well, five in total uh, that are independent of the T4 uh, symmetries and uh, wave. Okay. Yeah, let's skip the technicalities. Um, so let me define a, a new state, light state in the NS sector that I'm gonna build from this anti chiral primary I had on the previous page. I'm gonna act on this anti chiral primary with uh, combinations of the rigid, the global generators of, of some of the symmetries groups of the, of the CFT. And um, this, uh, this notation is, is very much uh, in line with the notation I was using for the gravity superstructure solutions. This is the range of where, where the notation comes from. So we have uh, the K here and, and M. So this obviously increases the R symmetry and the conformal dimensions of this. Now this is still a light state, but if we, we can think of our orbifold, thinking in the orbifold point, we can think of um, the orbifold CFD as capital N. In the untwisted sector, it would be capital N copies effectively of, of the, the CFD living on the circle. Uh, in the twisted sectors, we can then um, have, have uh, we can join some of those copies together. But let me, in, in the untwisted sector, we can think of having capital N total copies to work with. So I'm going to put uh, NA number of of those, those copies of the CFT in this uh, ground state, this vacuum state, and I'm gonna put the rest in this state here. But I still have a lot of parameters to use up. Now, this was uh, in this paper here by um, Russo, no, yeah, Russo, Shigemori, and uh, Cheplak. Um, they generalized to uh, a, wide, a slightly wider class of, of states where they also acted as uh, supersymmetry generators here. Now, quick comment, you may say, why am I think, where am I, why am I considering these particular states? Now, uh, clearly these are quite sp special states. Uh, they don't look like typical states. If I consider, if I've got in mind an ensemble of states, um, then these are clearly not typical states. Right? I only have two types of states that go into building this large state. Um, and one of them is very, very special, right? It's the vacuum. So, so what's the deal there? And, and you're right, these, everything that I will consider and, and basically all of the work so far, of, of the concrete work of the program so far is in terms of uh, atypical states. Now you have, you have to start somewhere. They still contain a lot of interesting information and also provide analytic working examples um, for, for, for the microstates of, of black holes or this particular supersymmetric black hole. And uh, yes, the idea is that you would form typical states from coherent sums of these type of states, for instance, but where you, you, you would have different uh, numbers here, different integers here, different modes. But that's just uh, as a caveat, but definitely this is of interest. Okay, now what, what can we do? We, we've uh, you know, done some hard work. We, as a program, you know, we have these um, bulk supergravity solutions that are the superstrata. Can we use it to understand some more about the CFT, calculate some interesting quantities? Well, let me consider this class of four point functions in the CFT. Now I'm gonna to refer to these as heavy, heavy, light, light uh, for obvious reasons. We have two pairs of operators, two are heavy and two are light. And uh, well, in the CFT, uh, I should just point out that uh, for pairs of operators, then the four points is the first time you, you have really dynamical information uh, that correlators are not fixed in, uh, by, by conformal symmetry. And uh, in general, are not protected. In the, as we move around the modular space of the CFT. And so this is interesting because we can do stuff in free field theory in the orbifold point. That's not really a problem, but that's not that interesting if we're interested in bulk physics because the supergravity point is at the other end of the spectrum, as it were. 
Um, okay, but if we know the geometries that are dual to these heavy operators, then we can calculate this four-point function as a two-point function in the geometry, in the bulk geometry that is uh, dual to these heavy operators. Oh, sorry. So, so yes, we can utilize our knowledge of these known geometries, for instance, the superstructure I showed earlier, and, uh, and calculate via fairly you know, standard ABS CFT methods this two point function here. We, we solve this sort of 6D wave equation, and it, depending on what this light operator is, uh, it can be just dual to a minimally coupled um, bulk scalar in 6D. Now, for instance, I mentioned that. Uh, particular nice classes of, of superstrata I, I showed uh, had separable wave equations. This helps dramatically to reduce the problem to 3D. And we do the usual thing. We look for normalizable solutions in, in asymptotic R expansion, extract the coefficient, and that gives us this two-point function. And this was done initially in these three papers. The first one considers uh, the kind of supersymmetric conical defect type superstrata, and the second two consider more non-trivial uh, superstrata. They actually consider the, the one zero zero and a slight generalization. And that's what I'm going to talk about in, in this next slide. So this, I just point out, bypasses a Witten diagram approach to, to calculating uh, holographic correlators. And maybe if I have time right at the end or if someone is interested, I can explain why exactly this is, this is important. Okay, so now I'm going to focus on a particular heavy state. And it's just going to be the heavy state that I get from spectral flowing this um, this n sector state. I have just k equal one m equals zero n equal zero, and I have n b copies of that state and n a copies of the, the n s n s ground set state. And this is dual. This state when uh, when spectral flow is dual to the um, one zero zero superstrata solution we saw earlier. And this is due to the ADS3 uh, vacuum. Now, we also have a constraint because we're this is an untwisted sector because k equal one here. And in untwisted sector, we have at capital N total copies of, of, the C, of the CFT on the T4. So we have this constraint between the NAs, but this is very natural uh, also from the bulk because we have these, again, these parameters A and B that were in the, the bulk solution, the geometry. And uh, the smoothness condition gives exactly this constraint. So that's nice. And for light states, I will just consider the simplest example, which is just uh, chiral primary with these conformal dimensions. But it's not too important. We can do different light states, but I need to pick something. OK, so what do we get? Well, let me organize this, the results in terms of an expansion in the parameter mu. And the mu is related to the ratio of the conformal dimension of the heavy operator to C. Now, in what we consider, uh, this will be less than one. Now, of course, H heavy is, is heavy, and so will be of order C, but we take it parametrically smaller than, than C, but still of order C, still scaling with C. So this is just a way we can organize our, the calculation. At, at zeroth order, I mean, this is what you expect. This is just the identity contribution to the four-point function, i.e. the disconnected uh, contribution. We just have like insertion of sort of what could be past infinity or in this case zero and at infinity of the heavy operators and then we have insertions on the boundary of, this, of the CFT cylinder uh, of the light operators and then this dash line is meant to represent um, just the identity contribution or disconnected part and then we also have other exchanges of operators on top of that. Now in this paper, the first of the two papers I had on the uh, previous screen. This is from Rousseau, Giusto, and uh, other authors. They found this result. So this is at first order in mu. And okay, this superleading term in the large n limit is 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 is, is disconnected. And, okay, not very interesting. This term not very interesting. The interesting part comes from this term. And this term, I can I can write these d hat functions you know, in terms of logarithms and dialogarithms in a specific form of the block thickness function. And the block thickness function is uh, very interesting, has very interesting analytic properties. Um, if z and z bar 
uh, complex conjugate variables, then this is a completely analytic uh, function uh, on the complex plane. But here we'll be interested in taking these as, as independent uh, complex uh, variables, and there it has some, some branch cuts. In here. Now, okay, this story I just pointed out was repeated uh, for different classes of, of heavy states. And stuff like that. Now, uh, the exists the showing up of this particular d hat functions uh, is interesting because well, these d hat functions came from uh, four point Witten contact diagrams. See, for instance, these ref these references for reviews and and also the original paper by Witten. Um, so this is interesting, but uh, uh, yeah, I. I can go into more detail if people are interested. But let me quickly give uh, another uh, avenue of attack, as it were, that something, some physics that we can try and extract from, firstly, from the superstrata solutions, and secondly, from, um, from these heavy, heavy light light correlation functions that we've already uh, computed. I should note that the previous heavy, heavy light light correlation functions I gave only. Uh, zeros and first order in mu, but um, actually in those papers for this particular choice of heavy operator, this four point function was calculated for all orders in mu in this parameter, um, but not in a closed form. Okay, I can, can mention more later if people are interested. So let me consider some particular physics. Let me consider some high energy fixed target type scattering, two to two. Um, this has a, a long history. This type of uh, iconal Reggie limit scattering has a long history in flat space, dating back to 1987. People like Tooft and, and uh, Armati and things like that. And we're going to take a, a geodesic or WKB type approximation to the propagate, propagation of bulk, bulk fields. This is all, I mean, this is a very simple calculation, but it turns out it can give us very nice information, and that's the best of both worlds. So let me give a particular definition of a quantity that I'm interested in in this calculation for a particular class of metrics, which it turns out for the superstrata that we've seen so far, this is true. We can define this quantity called the icon or phase shift, this delta. And this is in terms of, if you have suitable killing vectors, in terms of conserved uh, momentum. TPY and also just like geodesic lengths in T and Y coordinates. Very simple stuff. Um, here we have some, this, this dot here is what the result would be in empty ADS. So we measure the, the deviation from the empty ADS result. At the center, we'd have our superstrata. And so there is some deflection relative to the empty ADS case. We send in null geodesics from the boundary. They come in, there's some, mm, minimal uh, radius of approach and some impact parameter and it comes out very nice classical physics. Uh, some explanation of, of where this uh, definition comes from can be seen in this paper by uh, Andre Parnachev recently. Okay, but our interest is in the dual CFT. What can this tell us? So what is the, the, the regime in the CFT? So uh, these four-point functions depend on two conformal cross ratios, con uh, conformal invariance, and uh, what kinematical limit in the CFT four-point functions corresponds to this high-energy scattering, this Reggie I's scattering in the bulk? Well, over a series of four papers, um, uh, Cornalba, Costa, Panadonis, Chiapa showed that um, this specific analytic continuation of one of the conformal cross ratios around zero, followed by this double limit on the sec what turns out to be the second sheet of, of uh, the correlators, uh, coincides with this regiose type scattering in the bulk. This is non-trivial uh, because of the existence of logarithmic type branch cuts in, in correlation functions. And so really, this is a limit on the second sheet and not just some Euclidean OP limit in, in, the, in the CFT. Now, um, it turns out if you do a block by block analysis of this limit, uh, then you will find that blocks, uh, I mean, when I say, sorry, when I say blocks, I mean global conformal blocks. These are uh, contain hypergeometric functions and they uh, resum an infinite number of 
um, contributions of a global conformal primary or quasi-primary and all of its global descendants. These are con contributions to a four-point function. So they contain a lot of information, nice information. Turns out if you do it, if you look at an individual block, you see that blocks, uh, global blocks of large spin dominant. And by spin, I, I'm defining it here in terms of the conformal dimensions. Uh, and this is nice, but it seems like if you try to do this analysis block by block, you you quickly run into problems because generically there are an infinite number of verbal blocks in, in any uh, exchanged in any um, conformal four point function. And so an infinite, so so if I if you instead study this Reggie limit, you will get uh, a, a, a result that encapsulates an infinite number of uh, global block contributions to the four point function. So it's a way of accessing uh, a huge amount of information in a particular kinematical limit, nonetheless, but still it's very interesting. Now, how can we tie this together? So this is really two sides of the, of the coin. We have this on the bulk and this on the uh, CFT. And OK, uh, I, I don't have enough time to go into details, but there is you can find very nice um, precision matching between the bulk quantity of the iconal phase shift and CFD data of the exchange operators. So here I can just give a few interesting formulae. In uh, one of the, it, so you will get the exchange of these, this infinite family of, uh, of double, what are called double trace or composite operators um, that will form out of the external operators in the correlation function. And these are non-protected. And so away from the generalized free field, uh, three free theory uh, of infinite n, large n, uh, you will get anomalous dimensions and also corrections of three-point functions, the OP coefficients of these operators. This is interesting CFT data. And it turns out that you can get nice relations that map. If you look on the right-hand side, it only contains deltas. And the deltas, the lowercase numbers, is just an expansion in the mu parameter we had earlier. So order by order in mu, we can extract CFD data uniquely from bulk data, i.e. The, the phase shift. And also the C0, the, these are the generalized free field, free theory OP coefficients, which are okay, unknown anyway. So these are some nice relations. OK, this is just an example of, of what can be matched between them. And uh, let me, in, in view of time, let me give just statements of, of the current position of, of this type of work, where, where we are and what we want to do. So from work with uh, Cheplak, Justo, Russo, Russo we, uh, in a paper in July, and also, well, two papers to appear um, soonish. Um, so what we've done, we've extended the CFT Reggie type analysis, which, okay, I haven't had that much time to explain, but I have given the general gist. We've extended this to pure heavy states. Um, before it was very much considered only in thermal, like black hole backgrounds in ADS, and whose CFT interpretation, I mean, is not at all clear or non-existent. Um, a group in Dublin, led by Andrew Panacher and Manuela Kulaksizi, um, they, in this paper, studied um, this type of, of, uh, of, of bulk setting in ADS3 conical defect computations without any real clear CFT interpretation, giving, using um, various sort of vacuum block approximations to uh, heavy, heavy, light, light four point functions. And, we gave a uh, concrete interpretation, CFT interpretation, in terms of pure heavy states of this computation here. We've also holographically matched the bulk phase shift with CFT data in the sense that I've kind of mentioned perturbatively in mu for different classes of families of, of superstrata, i.e. different heavy operators. And very recently, and to be released, it kind of another use that we've made of these heavy, heavy, light, light four-point functions, which came from our knowledge of these superstrata solutions, is that we've been able to get a first window on higher point CFT 
correlators. Um, by higher points, I mean, well, more than four, uh, but also more than more than five points, which is what had been done previously. And it turns out there's some very interesting uh, mathematics in terms of the types of functions that uh, appear in these correlators. Now, what would we like to do? Well, we've been doing things perturbatively in this parameter mu, and this is actually a, 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 an expansion that is around deviations from ADS and PADS. Now, this is clearly not what we want for a black hole, but, but it's still legitimate within the ensemble of the black hole. But really, we want to get closer, i.e. extend the length of that throat in that diagram I had earlier. And this, the idea is to try and use this technology to make, uh, to make things doable and approach the black hole regime. Uh, the general uh, I, uh, thing, dream that we would have from this whole program is that can consistency, consistency requirements of the CFT, so crossing, uh, you know, bootstrap crossing symmetry and uh, unitarity, these type of things, can they predict uh, and tell us interesting information about the bulk physics, the black hole? modifications of classical horizons, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe we need to deal with typical states rather than atypical states. Uh, and that's that's where I'm going to finish. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, questions and comments? I have some questions about this superstrata. Could you please do, open the like black hole thingy. Here? <laughs> mm, yeah. uh, yes. Uh, now, uh, as far as I understand, the main point of this stratum business is to replace the space time region of a black hole with a smooth, uh, smooth manifold let me say the, so we don't have the singularity uh, so if we didn't uh, replace this black hole uh, the asymptotic structure is the same r r that's right, right? yes yeah. and this is kind of i mean this is a desire right we we would like the asymptotic structure to be the same because from far away we, we see a classical black hole i i, I see I, okay uh, my question is uh, uh, for a black hole, we have sort of a horizon beyond it. And the here, this superstratum mode, does it behave it like a horizon or is it, uh, is it a special region in the system? Uh, what does uh, happen to an object if it passes through this superstratum yeah. mode? Yeah, for example can, can it come come back from the re inside the region okay good yeah this is this is a this is obviously a nice physical question right this is what you want to know if i change my description from what gr tells me do i still get the same type of physics right yes exactly so yeah there is as you said that there's no horizon in these solutions and well that's what we want um mm -hmm. now if i have Okay, this is only one family. I just will say again, this is only one family, this particular family of, of superstrata or, or microstates of the black hole, but let's consider this family. If I take uh, members of the family with different uh, parameters A and B and N such that I have a very long throat, right? So this will close, more closely approximate the sort of classical black hole idea. Uh, in, in the classical black hole, I have an infinite throat, but okay, I have a very long throat. And so I can think about, can I send in uh, probes, uh, either semi-classically or stringy probes, and what happens? And this is definitely being looked at somewhat. Now, the, uh, okay, in a sense, the Reggie, uh, kind of picture scattering I had right at the end, the bulk uh, scattering is essentially uh, you're sending in geodesics. This is R equals zero. So you're sending in geodesics depending on your scaling of relative scaling of your parameters. It, the geodes no geodesics come in. 
and then come out. And this is kind of, I mean, this is highly semi-classical and, and okay, you have to ask about regimes of validity in terms of what's the minimum impact parameter that this calculation is valid for. Um, when do you have very, in this throat, you have very strong tidal effects that disrupt things like BWKB approximation, and these other things that, that were in that particular setup. So you have to be careful in terms of validity, but yes. Um, people have also looked at stringing probes in here, calculating um, holographic Green's functions and, and looking at and looking at what happens. And there are some, some very interesting results. And yes, what happens is it does come back out. And if this is a very long throat, it takes a very long time. In fact, it takes time of order N1, N5. Now, N1, N5 were the number of uh, B brains, right? Of the different types, and we are generally considering a large N limit. So this is a very long time uh, after some thermalization times, but it does come out. And so this type of like semi capture, as you might call it, is kind of the the first ball way of 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 having the same physics as as a, as a horizon. Right now, of course, over short time scales, the effect is the same. Right, you lose your probe. But in the case of superstrata, or, or in terms of microstate geometries, it comes back out after a very long time. So yeah, that's the idea. Now, you uh, this is this um, I'm referring to work by uh, authors uh, Yusuf Benner and uh, Nick Warner from Paris Saclay, and uh, also um, Emil Martinek, and uh, in in recent papers uh, within the last year or year and a half, and they have some. Well, you can see some very nice plots in that diagram that show the deviation of the um, holographic uh, Green's functions from the like BTZ versions. And there you see something coming out. In the BTZ version, the Green's functions will just decay to zero, right? Because they don't come out. Uh, whereas in the in the superstructure, you you it, they kind of decay very small, and then after a very long time, they come back up, and you get an echo. Of the initial signal, but yeah, um, more details definitely found in, in other papers. Thank you. Let me ask one more thing. The, you said that geodesics come in and come out. Uh, it, it may take a very long time, but uh, do they intersect with the superstratum mode, or uh, they they are always, let me say, left to the Superstratum mode. They can, uh, can they intersect with the uh, again, superstratum is, mode? Sorry. Uh, again, this is a question of regime of validity. Once you once you enter very deep into the throat and you're starting to access the cap, what we call the cap region, for lack of a better word. Um, it, well, we have in also a picture that. This is the center of our geometry, and this is well in the stringy picture. This is where we put our deep brains, right? And um, is right at the center. And you've got to be very careful because at some point your supergravity approximation is definitely going to break down, and you're actually going to start probing like um, an S matrix effectively of, of the scattering between the probes and the deep brains if they're stringy probes and 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 deep brains. And there you're going to have to deal with excited bound states of of, of brains and, and all sorts of uh, complicated uh, stuff, which isn't uh, visible in this supergravity approximation. So, yeah, if you're just talking about no geodesics, no, you, you, your regime validity will stop way before that. It will it will stop actually somewhere here in the throat where you have um, excessive tidal forces. Thank you very much. Yeah, no Thank you. I can ask a small question as well. Marcel, so you, you told us that you used certain atypical states, right? Um, because they were special to your calculations and they're easier to handle, I guess, in certain senses, if I'm correct. All right. So, and they, you told us that they contain valuable information and you are talking about black hole microstates. So how do you, how do you understand so if I give you a bunch of states, okay, these are your black hole microstates, you're going to work with these. How do you compare them in terms of information they contain? Well, 
but by the fact that we don't ha currently have, but by we, I mean, as a community, we don't currently have um, explicit uh, typical states and good control over calculations with these typical states. There are lots of ideas, but so the current state of the program is, is saying, okay, turns out that if we, you know, if we allow atypical states, you know, if we, if we just reduce our, our scope to these atypical states, it turns out we can, we can extract some nice information. Now, if you're not interested in black holes, it's still interesting that these huge families of solutions of supergravity exist. I mean, a priori, it's totally not obvious that they exist and uh, non-trivial to find. But uh, your hope then is that you can still learn something about black holes or black hole type behavior from these atypical states. Of course, you would then have to ask, you know, realistically, uh, how much can I expect to learn about black holes from atypical states in the ensemble? Okay, but uh, I always have in mind a box of gas, right? If all the molecules are in the bottom corner, it's atypical, right? Or if they're all got the same velocity, it's atypical, but it's still part of the ensemble. And one hopes that, well, one hopes that you can learn something from those individual states, but uh, more importantly, maybe then build typical type, more typical states out of these atypical states by making kind of linear uh, superpositions of these, of these atypical states. So if you can, I don't know, the idea is if you can create enough of, well, one idea is if you can create enough of these atypical states, you might be able to make some kind of ensemble of those um, subclass of states. It's not all, clearly not all of the states, and um, clearly not all of the states will be described by a geometry as well, right? I should point out. So you're only accessing a subclass of states, but yeah, maybe the idea is we can do calculations with um, uh, linear superpositions of these of these atypical states, yeah. And a little tiny bit of work has been done in that direction, but it becomes very difficult. Okay, all right, thanks, thanks Marcel. Thing, one thing I should say is you can yeah. do the usual entropy counting type problems with these subclasses of states and try and see how much of the uh, macroscopic entropy of a black hole that you, you get, right? And okay, as it kind of expected, you don't get the full entropy. <laughs> The but is it is it I, I i would expect i mean of course not the full entropy but i would expect substantially small amount of entropy as well is it true but you still get a macroscopic entropy ah okay okay all right so okay but it's just okay a, that's nice that's nice dealing with with the ends right the, the new the new one but it still scales with n okay all right yes now i see what you're saying thanks no problem Thank you very much again. If we, if there are more questions, we can take maybe one more question in the last few minutes. If not, we can we can thank you again uh, for accepting our invitation and talking here. Thanks again, Marcel. Thanks very much. Thank you, Marcel. Hope to see you here. I hope so too. See you.